Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's already August, and it's only 18 days to the eclipse, according to Dr. Jiju. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Virginia Powell. Dr. Powell is the medical director and section chief of the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit here at Carillion. She has a very interesting history. She started with a BS in nursing, did a master's in public health at Johns Hopkins University prior to her medical training at University of Maryland and San Diego Children's Hospital for Critical Care Fellowship. She's worked for many years in Oklahoma prior to being recruited back to uh, Roanoke by Dr. Alice Ackerman, who she worked with as a resident, as a resident at University of Maryland. Dr. Powell generously lends her time to numerous committees and QI projects here at Carillion, as well as being a teacher, author, and mentor. And she's also very actively involved in the community, in the Big Brothers, Big Sisters organization and the 4-H, as well as being a PTA volunteer. Please welcome the very busy Dr. Virginia Powell. Thank you. Good morning. Um, this morning I'm gonna talk about uh, malignant hyperthermia. Um, when you're hot, you're hot. Um, I have no financial disclosures to make. Uh, my objectives are at the conclusion of the presentation that you will feel a bit more comfortable identifying the uh, symptoms that would suggest the malignant hyperthermia in the early stages, uh, be prepared to start early stabilization, and then to be able to counsel families regarding testing for malignant hyperthermia um, but the genetic and muscle biopsy testing that will go over in the end of the talk. Uh, I'm going to start with a case, and um, one of the difficulties we have right now with presenting with cases is that the residents steal all of our good cases for a case of the week. And I had the fortune of being on for a three-day weekend by myself, so I got this case and some of the residents stole it from me. Um, this is an eight-year-old female. Um, who had surgery on a Friday. She had a past history about six months prior to this presentation where she had had a lesion on her skull bone. Um, okay. They had uh, surgically uh, corrected that, but she had had uh, a small CSS leak and was going back to the OR just to repair this small leak. The plan was it was going to be an outpatient surgery. She'd go home that day. Um, Pre-op, she wasn't noted to have any sort of intercurrent illness, no febrile illness, no URI symptoms, nothing to be concerning. Um, and there had been no report of problems with her surgery the first go-round. And when asked for family history, there was um, the only anesthesia family history was that the father's mother had some difficulty with nausea post-anesthesia, um, but didn't give any other uh, concerning information about anesthesia with the family. Her course was very much like the first course she had had in terms of what medications were used. Uh, succinylcholine was used for her intubation. Sevoflurane, uh, nitrous oxide, fentanyl, and rocuronium were used during the case. Um, her vital signs and temperature were stable. For the majority of the case, it was about a four and a half hour case. And for the first three and a half hours, um, her vital signs were completely stable. Uh, no evidence of an elevated uh, temperature, although on the flow sheet, um, on this particular anesthesia flow sheet, it doesn't uh, show the temperature with every block, but um, other vital signs were completely stable until about the three and a half hour mark. Um, she developed a precipitous rise in her uh, end tidal CO2, her temperature, and heart rate. And this is a snapshot of her record. Where's the, the mouse part? Show me that. The, um, basically, the red dots at the top demonstrate her heart rate going up, and then down at the bottom, which is a bit too small to see from here, um, but her end title starts to go up um, in the last two or three blocks, which are five minute increments, and then the temperature spikes to 104.4. Um, and this would be very concerning to an anesthesiologist that malignant hyperthermia has started. Uh, 
her anesthesiologist recognized this and responded very quickly. Um, they stopped the sevoflurane and replaced it with propofol, which is not associated with triggering malignant hyperthermia. Um, she was given dantrolene, which we'll talk about as in the body of the talk, and um, some ice for cooling. Um, she had 100% uh, oxygen, increased uh, minute ventilation, and within 15 minutes, the temperature had dropped to 99 range, and her um, other vital signs were normalizing. After the surgery, she was admitted to the PICU, um, intubated uh, for further uh, dantrolene therapy and monitoring over the next few days. That you know, doesn't show very well in terms of from there, but you can tell all the dots start to come back down again and uh, decrease fairly quickly to 99.8 and 97.9. And by the time she got to the unit, she had a febrile. The malignant hyperthermia was first described in 1962 in Australia. Two colleagues, Stinborough and Lovell, um, described a case, a surgical case, in which a young man had a broken leg. They wanted to surgically repair this under anesthesia. And in getting his past medical history, he was very anxious uh, because he said he'd had 10 family members who had died as a result of anesthesia, um, either during their surgical cases or shortly thereafter. And this um, caused these physicians to be interested in what was going on. Um, and uh, in this particular patient, he did have the surgery. Um, they were using halothane, which is an inhaled anesthetic for anesthesia. And during the case, he did develop severe hyperthermia, tachycardia, tachypnea. Uh, they were able to uh, manage this. He was aggressively cooled and he did survive the procedure. Um, but because of this case, uh, Denenborough was a geneticist and in getting more details from the family um, after the surgery, realized that it followed an autosomal dominant pattern and that uh, caused some interest in exploring more. And so this was the first uh, description of um, malignant hyperthermia. And uh, after this point, there have been other case, more case reports and investigation, although there's still not a lot of literature out there about it. Um, next one. And then how do I highlight on it? Oh, this one. So in starting this, uh, working on this talk, I mentioned to my daughter what I was talking about, and she immediately said, well, you have to stop the case and ice them. I'm like, what? says, well, it's in season eight of Grey's Anatomy, and I'm on season 10 now, and I'm like a third-year medical student, so I know these things. So with that, I thought I'd find a clip from Grey's. Well, well is it going to work? This <laughs> Just thinking about it. Probably going to, like, crash now. Hello. Technical difficulties. All right, so we have to, I don't get to show my clip. 
<laughs> well, if you wanted to see it, if you just YouTube Google Gray's Anatomy and Malignant Hyperthermia, you get a nice little one-minute clip where they're in the OR and the vital signs go crazy and the um, temperature is, they highlight it's 106 and anesthesia is like, stop the case, we've got to ice this patient and everyone's getting excited and um, one of the residents is pondering and says, wait a minute, isn't this hereditary? And the rest that isn't in the clip that my daughter explained to me was that the whole family was in an accident and they were all in different ORs and they all went into malignant hyperthermia. <laughs> so then they like, I think, exhausted the dantrolene supply for the hospital, probably the whole city. But So I've not seen the full episode, but apparently it was exciting enough that even at season 10 now, she still remembers the details. <laughs> so, and this is not the daughter that's shadowing right now, so. <laughs> um, malignant hyperthermia is considered a pharmacotic <laughs> which was a new phrase for me, um, for both humans and swine. Um, the pharmacogenetics is a study of inherited genetic differences in drug metabolic pathways, which can affect individual responses to drugs, both in terms of using them therapeutically as well as adverse effects. And I think we're seeing a lot of um, medications now that are being looked at um, in terms of this pharmacogenetic, so I suspect that that's a phrase we'll see more often, but um, it was new for me, so I have to look it up. Um, malignant hyperthermia is not considered an allergy, but an inherited disorder, um, and the triggers are described as being inconsistent. The major triggers we talk about and are familiar with are the inhaled anesthetics, succulent choline can be as well, um, but uh, there may be other ones out there that we're not as aware of, and at the end I'll talk a little bit about just being more susceptible to things like heat stroke. Um, the um, triggers also are an incomplete penetrance where some family members uh, can carry the gene for it and not have re reactions to anesthesia where others do, and there can be cases where um, had a reaction one time and not the next time. The clinical presentation is an acute onset of one or more signs of a hypermetabolic state um, during or immediately following a general anesthesia uh, as a triggering agent is the classic presentation. Um, the most common sign of something starting is the unexplained rise in end tidal CO2. Um, and in this patient, uh, the end tidal CO2 went as high as 85 uh, after having been very stable throughout the case. Um, and was followed by the fever uh, developing afterwards. And in response to the end tidal CO2, uh, the practitioner, if they're seeing this, is gonna increase minute ventilation, but because the metabolic state is generating so much CO2, you're gonna find that you don't get much of a response uh, despite doing the right measures that you typically do um, when ventilating a patient. Um, other presenting features are gonna be the rise in temperature that we've talked about, uh, muscle rigidity, tachycardia, tachypnea in response to everything going on. And the laboratory changes will be the increased PCO2, uh, metabolic acidosis will develop, hyperkalemia, myelysis, and abnormal coagulation. What's going on in terms of pathophysiology is that um, the malignant hyperthermia is considered a subclinical myopathy and it's characterized by large quantities of calcium being released from the skeletal muscle sarcoplasmic reticulum, which then results in uh, stimulating uh, a sustained <coughs> contraction, uh, which evokes this massive exothermic response. Um, so basically the muscle, the skeletal muscles are turned on with the uh, release of calcium causing the muscles to spasm and this goes on uh, to the point of exhausting the metabolic pathways and causing the massive uh, energy expenditure, which will increase oxygen consumption. Um, and the oxygen consumption then will result in cellular hypoxia and the development of the lactic acidosis. The muscle rigidity we talked about is from the sustained muscular contraction, energy is consumed. Uh, ultimately, it can be consumed to the point of the myocytes uh, being um, destroyed, so cellular death, which will cause the release of large amounts of potassium. The acidosis will cause shifting of 
uh, hydrogen ions and potassium ions from the intracellular space as well, um, which will increase potassium, and then also the development of rhabdomyolysis, the destruction of the muscle cells. Um, and as we said, the uh, exothermic response. The hypermetabolic state then can lead to a congestive heart failure picture, um, so it can cause death in the operating room or in the case. Um, and the cellular death rhabdom and rhabdomyolysis leading to the hyperkalemic state can cause a cardiac arrest and um, in terms of over the next few days can also lead to renal failure, can have some bowel ischemia from shifting of blood supply and also profound muscular edema from the um, response to the uh, myocytes um, being depleted of energy and uh, various channels that are energy dependent for electrolytes um, are just are unable to function but energy. The etiology it was found as we said in the first couple slides is an autosomal dominant trait, but it does have reduced penetrance um, so that you may not be able to get a clean um, family history in terms of uh, how it's been transmitted. It's there are two general gene mutations that are recognized, the RY, R1 uh, which encodes the skeletal muscle um, in terms of the calcium release channel of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So in patients that have that gene, um, the channel where the calcium is released is abnormal, and what happens with the stimulus of the medications um, that are associated with uh, malignant hyperthermia is that those channels remain open um, inappropriately, causing this flush flood of calcium uh, that can then trigger the skeletal muscle response. And the CACNA1S um, encodes a subunit in the calcium channel, the sarcolene, um, and I found less information about the function of that gene. They're all located on gene 19, um, and it occurs, and looking at the epidemiology, some of it is difficult because if there's been a family history of malignant hypothermia, um, other family members may not be exposed to inhaled anesthetics that are the classic triggers, um, so they've not been given the opportunity to have malignant hyperthermia, which then makes it difficult to follow whether or not they truly have it. Um, but approximately one child of every 15,000 who receive general anesthesia, you'll see um, malignant hyperthermia develop. Um, as I said, many of the susceptibles have not been diagnosed due to not having received anesthesia. So if you haven't had it, you don't know if you have the condition. Um, in a report looking statistically at reported cases between 1987 and 2006, uh, they demonstrated eight cardiac arrests with four deaths, and the median age of those patients was 20 years of age. So it would be an age range that would be unusual to see a cardiac event um, so in support that it was the malignant hypothermia uh, response that led to their death. Treatment, um, the initial thing is just removal of the precipitating agent, which is usually the inhaled anesthetic. If you're just starting your OR case, you're going to try to convince the surgeon to abort the case while you're sorting out what's going on with the uh, response. If it's near the case, like it was with our patient, they changed the servo, they stopped the servofluorine and changed to um, propofol for the um, anesthetic agent. Uh, administering oxygen and hyperventilation, um, not only Will that help because the patient is becoming oxygen depleted, but with the hyperventilation, you're trying to wash the existing inhaled agent out of the lungs to increase how quickly uh, the medication is cleared from their system. Um, you want to investigate whether the patient has become hyperkalemic and treated aggressively if they have. Um, so sending off metabolic panels, uh, rapid and aggressive cooling measures, um, typically icing the patient using a cooling blanket. I think they iced our patient. Um, and administration of sodium bicarbonate, um, the alkalinization of the urine uh, is somewhat protective for uh, if uh, rhabdomyolysis is occurring to prevent the kidneys from shutting down from that. Um, and then administration of dantrolene. Dantrolene is a Actual, the actual receptor, it's a true antagonist to the receptor that is abnormal with a genetic condition causing malignant hyperthermia and produces a muscle relaxation by blocking excessive calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, thus stopping the 
pathologic cycle that's going on where the excessive calcium is being released and holding the muscles in the sustained um, contraction. Uh, of note, dantrolene is an expensive drug, so I didn't get the actual cost, but I'm sure it's not inexpensive. It has a relatively short half-life, so it needs to be redosed frequently based on patient symptoms um, and fevers. Uh, the, going on for further treatment, it'll be dosed periodically over the next 24 to 48 hours, and then serial labs and supportive therapy. So if the patient continues to have fever, uh, you want to use measures to keep them cool, uh, want to uh, do various things to treat the metabolic acidosis, such as bicarbonate, um, increased IV hydration to keep the skin flushed out. Um, they can develop a hypocalcemia because of using the calcium, so you may need to give more calcium. And then hyperkalemia, um, and wanting to treat that so you don't end up with a hyperkalemic cardiac event. Um, it was recommended that the patient remain intubated during the period that they were receiving the dantrolene because of the muscle weakness and concern that they would cause some hypoventilation. So with our patient, we did have a remain intubated for the next 24 hours. We did continue using um, propofol and fentanyl uh, for sedation. And on, at approximately 24 hours, we were able to extubate her. She didn't have any respiratory depression at that point. She did have some low-grade fevers over the next 24 hours, but she did not end up receiving any more. Um, dantrolene, and she ultimately did well and went home. I think it was post-op day two or three. Um, there is a malignant hyperthermia association of the United States, IMHOF. This was a very helpful site um, that we used at that time. The, from the operating room, the anesthesia geologist uh, actually called the number. If you go on their main site, you get this, this half of the screen is a screenshot from what comes up if you put this in. And then under the menu, they have for professionals, which is what this screen is, and it gives you the um, hotline number. And then each of these are links to other medical information with um, a whole outline of how to treat it, um, how to refer for genetic testing, um, other frequently asked questions and responses to that. And the physician that was available was very helpful. It was a lot like when we call the poison control. They check back with you periodically. Um, help direct therapy, um, add this to their numbers that they're keeping in terms of records. Um, so that was helpful. And um, he actually he referred had me refer the family to this site so that if they wanted to do testing down the road that they were able to use the site to find out where testing could be done, how much it cost, um, how to go about getting it set up. Um, the, test, the testing that we use primarily here in the United States is a muscle biopsy testing. It's called caffeine halothane contracture test, CHCT. It's only available at six medical centers in the U.S. and two in Canada, um, and there must be four in Europe. It's at 10 centers worldwide. Um, it's a very sensitive but not specific. There's a 22% false positive rate. The cost is about $6,000, and it is not uniformly covered by insurance. So the website does warn people to um, coordinate with their insurance agency first, or they'll be paying it out of pocket, and that a lot of the centers want payment up front because of this risk of not being reimbursed. Um, what this test is, um, they have to have fresh muscle, so you have to be at the site to have the testing done. They recommend that the children be over at least 10 years old just because of the amount of muscle tissue they take. And you can actually go on the um, MHOF site, and they have a little video that shows them doing a muscle biopsy. So they do a four-inch incision and take a nice chunk of muscle out and do the testing almost immediately so it's fresh muscle tissue. Um, so it can't, it's not something you could do at your home site and send to them because they do it on fresh muscle. Um, Wake Forest is our closest testing center, so for our location, it's fairly good. Um, the genetic testing is a blood test looking at one of, for one of the mutations, and um, this can be drawn and sent to the centers that run the, the blood work. Uh, they didn't give an estimate on the cost on the website for that, um, but again said to make sure, what was that? It's not a problem now. And financially, insurance would be fairly easy to cover. Okay. 
um, it will say that the patient is susceptible, but because of the various variants in um, presentation, it doesn't guarantee that they have it one way or the other, but that they're susceptible to getting it. Um, let me get back. The, this testing, the biopsy testing, the um, caffeine, halothane um, testing, they take the muscle um, tissue and they give a stimulus with caffeine and look at the contraction. And the point of doing a non-anesthetic as a, a stimulus was to show that the muscle itself is not hypercontractile without that stimulus. And then they do exposure to halothane and show that the uh, muscle from the malignant hypothermia patients does have a hyper response with an increased, um, it's more rapidly contracting and contracts at a, to a higher extent for a longer period of time um, when they're doing the testing. So um, that's basically what the, the caffeine halothane testing is. It's kind of interesting to see the little video. Um, let's see. Prognosis, if it's treated aggressively with current medical care, the mortality is under 5%. Um, however, looking at historical data, when it was first described, the mortalities were more in the 70% range. Um, so just recognition and, and aggressive treatment has dramatically changed the um, mortality, but certainly in places where you're not paying attention to the temperatures closely um, or uh, with less aggressive medical care immediately, uh, you can still see death. And then in terms of associated issues, and this is in the, on the website, it talked about whether it was even worth getting the um, genetic or muscle biopsy testing and why you would want to know, especially if you've already had a reaction to anesthesia. Um, but if it is due to a malignant hyperthermia condition, this could impact um, other heat exposure, heat tolerance, um, hypermetabolic tolerance um, activities. There were some studies that looked fairly recent looking at a uh, risk of heat stroke and, and it seems to be a higher risk in that as well. So that may um, impact things like whether you're able to join the military if you have a family history of only hypothermia. Um, there, the, the blood work saying that you're not a susceptible might be helpful if someone was really wanting to join the military. Um, it may also limit uh, just recommendations in terms of how physically active someone should be and, and how close attention to pay to heat exposure with that activity. Um, so that was other things to look at. It looks like there's probably, with more uh, genetic testing, a whole new area of research looking at how these are influenced by other things. And I've ended early. Does anyone have any questions? Or Dr. McDonald, do you have other comments that I missed? Mm -hmm. Hang on a second. Okay. I mean, she's she's a a poster child for uh, for the incomplete penetrance and yeah. give them that that background. Some of it we have to be careful about <laughs> since we're live broadcasting. So, go ahead. Okay. And well, in in part was the when we you know after the fact talking to her about the family history, we're not sure if that grandmother may have had issues with anesthesia complications because she has um, emphysema. So her anesthesia experience was a um, spinal anesthesia. She had local, and the dad didn't know if there was more to it as to why she had had local with a more recent surgery, which makes me wonder if she'd had some fever. And then you, this girl with that surgical case six months earlier when I went back in and looked at that anesthesia record, like they, they did document where I could see the temperature at every um, five minute interval. And in her last five minute interval, her temperature went up to 103. Um, and so I do wonder if she was starting with some evidence for malignant hypothermia with that, but the case was over and the stimulus was removed and uh, she did well in recovery, went to the PEDS floor and went home the next day without any evidence um, that she'd had an adverse effect, but if we had looked, maybe we would have seen more if the case was ongoing. Um, so 
but again, she just hasn't responded until she's been under the anesthetic for quite a while, so um, it could have easily been missed if it were a shorter case. Yes. That was a little curious to me that it was like three and a half hours into the case. Is that is that typical, or is it when you it's first get exposed? It's highly variable. Um, some people will respond on induction, and other people you're well into the case where it could easily have been missed if this were a quick little PE tube or something. You know, case reports of it not manifesting until up to 24 hours post stimulus. So. And that was a concern um, in terms of continuing the dantrolene for the 24 hours, and then even after we stopped it, if she were to have evidence of ongoing symptoms to restart it, because it could persist. So after an episode like this, what are the kind of uh, more longer term effects or uh, morbidities that you might experience? From what I've read in the literature, first off, in terms of any future surgeries, no one's going to want to give her an inhaled anesthetic, so it would change the surgical approach um, if you could do. Emily, did you have an answer? Okay. Um, and then the other literature that I had seen that I think is just in its beginning in terms of her susceptibility to things like heat stroke um, would definitely be there. And that looks as if it's just in the beginnings of people exploring that arm of how this abnormal uh, genetic response to the calcium channel is involved. But I didn't see anything outside of those sorts of issues. Dr. Powell, I know you said that uh, it seems to be variable, but it seems to be inherent within the muscle itself. Yeah. Is this seen more in people with a larger muscle mass, like males versus females, or I didn't see kids? any any um, comment on that. It just it it wasn't sex linked at all. Um, the autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant penetrance is what was seen when they do a genetic analysis. But uh, there are several cases of NICU um, babies, you know who may not have the muscle mass to generate this, just a lot of unexplained acidoses, things like that. So that there's no weight cut off, but no, that, that's, we've found that looking back, again, someone who manifests at a later time, that, but yet they had surgeries before, weight for less than a kilo at the time, maybe that's why, but totally, I just totally made that up. I mean, no one knows for sure. <laughs> So, of course, I have a genetics question yeah. about any follow-up with the family. What kind of counseling did you give the other family members? Um, so one of the comments I want to make, uh, which has been just really great for um, our practice here, is that in the last three years or so, the cost of genetic sequencing has come way down, and we're getting a lot more insurance approvals for medically necessary um, tests. And these um, genetic tests now are being offered by um, other commercial labs in the U.S. at a really very reasonable price. So I could even do something like this for $500 out of pocket at a particular lab in the U.S. So I would not consider price to be a, bar a barrier, but was curious about what kind of counseling the family got and if you had any follow-up about whether that child did have um, genetic testing from the referral site. The, um, the physician that I spoke with on the hotline um, throughout the weekend um, had advised that I had talked to the family about genetic testing being available, uh, that she was a bit young, she was only eight, that she was younger than they would like to do the um, muscle biopsy, but that's what he would recommend if they wanted a definitive yes, that's what it was or not. Um, although the symptoms, really, when you go into it, were pretty classic. So the other comment I want to make about genetic testing is that now we are replacing invasive procedures with blood draws for genetic testing. So this is happening like in osteogenesis imperfecta, for example. So we don't have to do invasive procedures or muscle biopsy for muscular dystrophy. So I, um, un I understand about um, maybe doing a definitive test in an older, more cooperative family member, but if you did sequencing and found a bona fide mutation that had been reported in lots of other people, there would be no reason to do a muscle biopsy. Yeah. with that history. And um, we did talk to them about you know, 
future family members having surgery, they need to share that she has malignant hyperthermia. Yeah. Virginia, you may not have heard about when I heard about this after all the excitement, and when I went up to go talk to mom and dad and their histories, that's when it was told to me, oh, yeah, this is my partner. This isn't dad. Yeah, but no, yeah, the so natural dad was who I had talked to him okay. as well, and he had never had surgery, so he right. didn't know, but it was his mother that they were thinking might be. Yeah. Okay, okay, so I want to make sure of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did for a minute, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. No, <laughs> I was aware of that. Any other questions in the room? One in the back, all right. After this one, I'll unmute the phones, and if you're on the line, I can open them up for that. You mentioned the increase in uh, them getting um, hyperthermia. How significant is that? Do you have like the relative increase or the absolute increase? I'm trying to see if it's significant enough to limit the activities that these patients can do. I don't have a number in terms of what the temperature is. There is an algorithm on the hotline webpage that talks about whether or not they should limit activity. Um, in a patient that's considered a susceptible, meaning they've not had an anesthetic agent to say that they have malignant hyperthermia um, presentation, they tell them that they can exercise, but if they develop high fevers or have any evidence of heat stroke, that then physical activity should be limited. In a patient that's actually had a malignant hyperthermia event like our girl, it talks about limiting activity in heat situations or excessive amounts of activity. All right, I'm going to open up the phones here. Uh, if you're on the line and you do not have a question, if you would just mute your phone so we don't hear your background noise. The conference is now in talk mode. Okay, if anyone on the line has a question for Dr. Powell, now's your chance. Okay, anyone going once, going twice? Anyone else in the room have a question or comment? No? All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Powell. Thanks. Okay, as always, you can email us at outreach at CorellianClinic.org if you have a question for the presenter and didn't get to ask. With that, we're going to go ahead and disconnect the phone lines now. Thank you all very much.